For Module 1, you are going to return to your SurveyQ link. You're going to begin survey for your Module 1 EDC. During this module, we're going to learn all about data management. We're going to start by understanding that data management is the practice of collecting and organizing and storing and protecting data so that it can later on be analyzed. It involves everything from the management of the research data during the lifetime of the research project, and it also involves decisions on how the data is going to be preserved, shared, and the, after the project is later completed. I have here a diagram of the process where you start by gathering your raw data, then you have to process the data, and then you prepare the data for completion. This might mean having subsets of data that is cleaned and uploaded and placed at, at different stages and in different formats. Data that's collected for human subjects has additional requirements that have to be considered. And so managing human subject data protects the privacy and the confidentiality of your participants and for the safety of the research data too. As an investigator or a study team member, it is your responsibility to do all you can to upload and uphold the pledge you make to your participants during your informed consent process to protect their privacy and keep their data safe. Your research data must be protected from many things such as loss, theft, corruption, and cyber attack. The more sensitive the data, the more significant these threats become. So let me introduce you to an electronic data capture. An electronic data capture is a system is, is a software system that stores patient data that has been collected for clinical trials. Medical data that's captured during the clinical trials about the patient's conditions, their status, safety data about the clinical trial, test results in labs, patient surveys and questionnaires such as their quality of life or their electronic data diary or their memory aid patient information that's recorded by any apps or devices, such as their blood glucose the monitors and things like that. Electronic data captures also pertain to studies that are not at the level of a clinical trial, but might just be observational. So they do qualify for anything that is human subject. The history of an EDC is that back in the 1990s, the pharmaceutical industry built what was called a remote data capture, it's called an RDC software, to electronically record patient data at clinical study sites. And RDC systems, they were built for an offline isolated system that did not send the feedback directly to the study coordinators. But with the rise of the internet, the RDC systems became a scaffolding for what would be a more sophisticated computer and web-based clinical system, such as an electronic case forms and patient reported outcome systems. And these tools made it much easier and quicker to conduct the clinical trials. However, these systems also have limitations that may have caused problems. For example, an electronic clinical uh, an electronic case report form, also called an ECRF, and required the study staff to enter the information, whereas a patient reported outcome system, also called a PRO, um, requires that the patient is providing the information. These limitations uh, on the clinical trials were problematic for the data capturing and analysis. The development of the EDC software was created to bridge the gap between the ECRFs and the EPROs and to pull together all the different parts into a unified clinical system that effortlessly manages all aspects of the data collected. EDCs today provide a single platform for accessing information entered into consents, CRFs, PROs, and anything else that you might need to enter. A key feature of an EDC software is that it is an electronic interoperability, meaning that clinical systems used to record patient data should integrate easily with an EDC system. For example, you might integrate with an electronic medical record such as EPIC. Using the standards defined by the Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium, 
called CDISC, across all the components of your electronic data capture clinical system is one of the best ways of achieving electronic interoperability. There are a lot of common vendors that are out there that have EDCs. Some examples include REDCap, Bioclinical, Metadata Solutions, DataTrack International, Oracle Corporation, Open Clinical, and IBM. There's also custom developed EDCs that are very common. Components of the EDC usually include a graphical user interface that is intended for data entry, some type of validation component used to check the user's data for correctness, and a reporting tool used for analysis of the collected data. Common features include some type of CRF or PRO designer including a, a clinical trial management system sometimes to manage the data, such as the study site information and the IRB approvals. Typically, you will see a point and click or a drag and drop options for making it very easy to develop these softwares and limiting the amount of programming skills required. Lots of times the options to choose from form standard forms are saved in a global library so that you don't have to recreate it every time you, you start up a study. It can commonly be used across multiple sites and across multiple studies because the capability of web browsing allows other users to also enter, your inform enter, enter information into the EDC very easily. Data standard adherence is a very common feature in the designer because standards such as CDIS standards allow for end-to-end -end use and interoperability can occur then throughout the life cycle of the study. There's also standardized coding programs such as WHODRUG and MetaDRA, meta which is, can be used to capture all lists of of known drugs and all lists of known conditions, medical conditions and procedures. Edit checks can be programmed to help prevent invalid data from being entered and validations to occur. Another common feature that you'll see in an EDC is a data entry into the electronic system. The protocol is set up to the system and data is collected by the coordinator or other assigned study staff. Double data entry is very common Sometimes you'll see things like a web response system uh, or an interactive randomization or drug management system. Another feature that is very common in an EDC is some type of query management. This is where you would be doing your risk-based monitoring to protect the participants real time. Sometimes there's streamlined communication between the monitors, the data managers, and the coordinators through these systems. You have the capability of auto-generating queries or manually entering queries, and that all the queries can be responded to and resolved by the different roles, the monitor, the data manager, the coordinator, before the database is locked. Lastly, a very common feature in an EDC is some type of data export. The EDC is being used to collect the data and store the data, which means you need to be able to move the data and extract the data into other systems when it's time for analysis. So a data export allows you to easily, uh, easily export the data and extract patient data, have subsets of data, you can have reporting options to generate standardized and customized reports throughout the clinical trial, and you can also build in metrics quite often utilizing these features. EDCs have very many benefits. They increase the efficiency of the study by allowing for data quality and accuracy to increase. You can have real-time access to your centralized data. You can have built-in edit checks to prevent inaccurate and illogical values. You can reduce data errors through field types and validations. You can allow for discrepancies and safety issues that are captured. And you can also have systems in place that connect the, to external systems, such as other types of reporting tools. The code books and the data dictionaries available help in keeping the data quality good 
and the accuracy accurate. You have control forms for translations and version, version control, which is also helpful. Another thing that helps with the efficiency of the study is it reduces time. When you have adaptive data capture and real-time data monitoring and data analysis, you can see what's occurring uh, much faster. Capture data can be exchanged electronically between sites. You can have, um, there's no secondary data entry process, which also decreases the cost. You can have less time spent on query management and reduce numbers of on-site monitor visits. It's very easy to set up typically, and they're efficient for it capturing the data. Another benefit to an EDC is the cost effectiveness. It reduces the budget allocation for an on-site monitoring visits. You decrease the, the case report form shipping and the printing costs. You decrease the query management budget reduced um, significantly because of the validations and the accuracy and data quality are increased. The cost of the EDC ranges from free, such as REDCap, to expensive um, systems. There are many open size clinical data management systems available on the market. Another thing to take into consideration about the benefit of an EDC is your data security. Your EDC system is hosted online with data entry completed on a web-based certificate. It's encrypted between the web browser and the application. Each user account is designated with permissions that are based on their role, and security access is authenticated to the login of the user rights. An audit trail provides a record of all the changes that are made in the database, and data security provides an audit trail to track all the record changes. Compliance allows for the EDC to be compliant with, with regulatory, regulatory requirements, such as the FDA's requirements, and software should, be, should have technical controls in place to ensure the data integrity and backups occur. There are different types of data, that you, data compliance that you have to take into consideration. For example, HIPAA is, a federal, uh, is the Federal Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. This is the primary one that, you're, that you might run into because it is the one that is for healthcare and health information. Another one would be FERPA, F-E-R-P-A, which is for the Privacy Act that governs the educational system. It is possible you might run into research studies that have to take into consideration those regulatory. Two more that might be something you have to take into consideration at some point would be GLBA, which is for financial institutions, and PCI DSS, which is for exchanging of funds and money. It is possible you might do a research study that has to take into consideration those two. For, for REDCap, the one that is primarily used is health data. And so when you have to take into consider health data, there are many additional requirements that might pertain to your studies. If you are doing a clinical trial with data that goes to the FDA, you have to take into consideration things such as 21 CFR Part 11 compliance. If you're doing international, you need to also take into consideration things such as the IC, IC HE6, which is the Good Clinical Practice Guidelines. And um, depending on where you are collecting your data, you might have additional regulatory components that you might need to consider. So REDCap. REDCap was created in 2004 at Vanderbilt. It originally supported by a small group of clinical researchers who developed a secure data collection tool that met the HIPAA compliance standards. It quickly became their go-to method for supporting both single and multi-site research studies. REDCap's developers, they firmly believed that nobody could know the research as well as the researcher. So a user-friendly web-based interface was introduced to put the researchers in total control of their work. There's no background knowledge or technical experience that's needed to use REDCap. Researchers could directly manage their own projects whenever and however they wished. 
through any browser on any device. Vanderbilt has now been able to invest minimal institutional resources yet still safely and reliably support an increasing number of research studies in REDCap. They explored ways to disseminate the now mature software as well as foster broader collaborations for future development. So in 2006, the REDCap Consortium officially launched. The consortium began as a handful of nonprofit organizations that were interested in expanding REDCap's functionality through collaborative software development. Each partner site was given access to the code base so that they could install their own REDCap system and offer it to their researchers, just as Vanderbilt had done for their own clinical researchers. The consortium focused on building a very strong community with international participation right from the start. REDCap usage began to grow rapidly as the organization realized they could fully customize their systems to meet their local security policies, personalize their features and functions to address their needs, and have direct input into the future direction of the software at no cost. Over the next few years, the consortium sites across the world found the REDCap empowered them to take control of the work in a way that they couldn't with previous data collection tools. So researchers reported that the very process of using the software actually improved research through REDCap's fundamental features, functionalities, things like project setup checklist and shared libraries of pre-built instruments. The consortium established an annual in-person conference in 2009 and continued to expand REDCap in its subsequent years, introducing new features to support my diverse types of data collection. The software evolved in, into a neutral data collection platform capable of capturing any type of data for any purpose. REDCap is now used for just about any type of data collection you can imagine across thousands of nonprofits and government organizations. Each system is under independently maintained and supported. So consortium partner sites truly do have all the control and it's still provided at absolutely no cost. REDCap offers a free, easy to use, secure method of flexible yet robust data collection. The REDCap consortium continues to actively develop the software, relying on feedback of a passionate global community. Partner sites can participate and a variety of consortium activities, networking, and educational opportunities as much or as little as they wish. I highly recommend that you take the energy and time to watch the, the detailed overview of the training video. These are items I'm not going to go over in this video. You're going to need to watch the video on your own. There is a link here for you to follow through to the videos. Just so you have more information, if you ever wanted to join the public health work group, it is available to all users and not just the admin group at the international level. The CCTST has a REDCap instance. In 2009, the CCTST through Cincinnati Children's Medical Hospital Center joined the REDCap consortium and obtained their first instance of REDCap. It's been administered through the Biomedical Informatics Division at CCHMC. Up until 2017, we did not have a dedicated administrator for the application. It was just managed by the research help desk. In 2017, the CCTST decided to subsidize the cost of REDCap for a research partners. We have had an official REDCap program since November of 2017. Our program has four REDCap administrators for two production instances. Find more information out at the Cincinnati REDCap Resource Center. Obtaining REDCap is easy. All you have to do is go to the CCTST's website and request access to REDCap. If you find that you are going to be doing research for UC, Children's, or any partner of the CCTST, Access is free to you. Request a project through the CCTST and you can have as many as you want. That ends module one. And at this point, you're gonna to wanna to go back and complete your module one assignment.